The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by BigStar.com with thousands of videos and DVDs for the whole family. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. There's really only one mega celebrity in the computer industry, and that is Bill Gates. He's one of the best known people in the world. He's one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he knows a lot about software in the computer business. He's also a bit of an enigma. Hard to get a handle on what kind of guy he is. He seems a geek in some ways, a ferocious competitor in other ways. We recently had the unique opportunity to tape an exclusive interview with Gates. He was unusually relaxed and provided more insight than usual into how he thinks. Obviously, one thing Gates has been thinking about a lot these days is the Justice Department's antitrust suit against Microsoft. What is ironic about the charges of invincible monopoly against Microsoft is that Bill Gates seems to really believe that his company, far from being immune from competition, is very vulnerable to it. Beyond believing in software, if there's a second uh, fundamental part of the Microsoft culture, it's to say to ourselves, is this the day that we're being eclipsed? I mean, you know, we lived through IBM being eclipsed. Uh, we lived through Wang being eclipsed. I grew up using digital computers. I worshipped digital. I thought, oh, wow, someday I'm going to meet Ken Olson. But by the time I met him, he wasn't really Ken Olson anymore. We are in the customer feedback loop. We're seeing our shortcomings all the time. You know, the support call that takes two hours, the opaqueness of our, our interface. We are very good at, at giving ourselves a hard time uh, about, you know, the things that we're going to have to fix uh, to be able to stay around and, and play a role. During a speech prior to that interview, Gates talked about the risk of failure for Microsoft and the steps he takes to make sure the company doesn't fail. You know, about a decade ago, people would always send me mail saying, we won uh, a certain account. And I'd think, well, okay, they sent me one piece of mail, so we won one account. Did we lose every other account? Uh, because they never sent me mail about the accounts we were losing. Uh, so I, I laid down a rule that uh, you have to send bad news in equal measure with good news. You, you just can't send me only good news. You also have to tell me uh, what things uh, we may have to change. Because bad news is 100 times more actionable than good news. You don't cancel appointments or change priorities uh, based on, on good news. And certainly in the world of technology, take every technology company that failed. Their sins, their big mistakes, were all made in the years of their greatest profitability. Uh, and so we have to magnify every little thing that happens and try and see, is that a trend? Is there something we can learn from it? Uh, do we need to change direction uh, to be more on top of things? But Gates' big problem right now is not the competition, it is the government. John Gage of Sun Microsystems is one of Gates' biggest critics, and he supports the DOJ action. Microsoft is the cash register. Microsoft can be the airline reservation terminal. Microsoft can be the place you buy and sell automobiles. Microsoft can threaten every insurance company. Microsoft's at this monopoly position far more pervasive than Standard Oil ever was because the entire economy now depends upon these things working. That's the reason that the suit by the United States government is so important about business behavior, nothing to do with technology or innovation. David Kirkpatrick of Fortune magazine says there is a growing body of evidence against Microsoft. There is an increasing body of opinion and government says evidence that they have actually broken the law in the way they compete and that they have used illegally heavy-handed tactics in, you know, forcing people to exit from businesses that inconvenience them and using their dominance to pressure companies to, to withdraw products or to slow down development or change development. If that's proven, I believe it ought to be stopped. While the immediate threat to Microsoft is the antitrust action, there is a growing sense that Microsoft and Gates really are at risk, not because of the government, but because of changes in computer technology. The whole desktop model, the strength of the Windows monopoly, is giving way to a new connected computing model in which operating systems may become irrelevant. There's a real irony right now, and that is that at the same time that the government is really honing in and, and potentially 
poised to seriously inhibit Microsoft's competitive capabilities uh, as they've defined them themselves. The market at the same time is changing in such a way that really could hurt Microsoft. The risks to Microsoft of the developing movement towards thin client computing and uh, technology that will not be Windows based that will be disseminated far more uh, ubiquitously in our lives. And people are talking about you know, the world of six billion connected devices in a few years and, and asking what percentage of those devices will be uh, carrying a Microsoft operating system. And I think most people who ask that question presume that the answer is a fairly low percentage. You know, our view is there's no way that Microsoft is going to be able to own 85% of that market. So this whole idea, uh, which is really sits at the, pin, uh, at the center of the Department of Justice uh, suit with Microsoft, that they somehow uh, have this uh, mon monopolistic advantage over the rest of the market, uh, we just don't think will play out uh, in the future. I think Microsoft is in a fragile position, and I think Bill Gates realizes this. On the one hand, he must invest a lot, much more than he is, in becoming a competent, professional computer company that makes products that don't break. And he's doing that, to his credit. And he realizes that in this new arena, where the PC is a tiny part of the overall computing environment, to move into the small devices, into the consumer devices, into the appliances, the refrigerators, the air conditioner, he has nothing that works there. The growth of information appliances and mobile computing devices is opening up new opportunities for other software companies. Microsoft clearly is trying to get Windows into all those appliances, but I think it's much harder to make the case for saying that there's a benefit to having your car run the same operating system as your database in, in the enterprise. Uh, so I think it's a harder argument to make. The other problem is, and uh, challenge is for Microsoft, is that if you think about it, the requirements for software in embedded uh, environments are that the software has to be incredibly small and incredibly reliable. And I would challenge anybody to think of a single Microsoft product in their history that you could ever have described as small and completely reliable. Indeed, many of Gates' competitors would prefer that the market, rather than the government, deal with the power of Microsoft. Fortune magazine's David Kirkpatrick sees several negatives to the antitrust action. One is that Microsoft does continue to be the engine of the technology industry in many respects. And the degree to which it gets slowed down really could slow down the entire industry. And number two, I think simply having the government meddling around in the technology industry could be a very bad precedent. Frankly, you know, many people say that companies like Netscape have also done similarly heavy-handed things. Um, Oracle, IBM, SAP. Uh, there are a number of very powerful companies in this industry that have been accused, rightly or wrongly, of uh, using their dominance in unfair ways. It's anybody's guess as to what the outcome of all of this will be, but David Kirkpatrick thinks whatever the outcome, Microsoft and Bill Gates will never be quite the same after this. Bill is spending a lot of time thinking about what the Justice Department is doing, and he's spending an awful lot of time being deposed and strategizing inside his company, and I think he's finding it, enormous, it an enormous distraction, and he's, he's annoyed by it tremendously. Um, my suspicion is that it's going to really make a big difference for Microsoft, and he doesn't really want to think about how big of a difference it may make. Bill Gates does realize he's in a risky business, well, but he says comment. he likes it that way. If you want to be safe, this is the wrong business to be in. Uh, I think the reason most of us are in this business is because things do change, and it's very interesting, and no one not Microsoft, not Intel, not anyone has a guaranteed position. And unless you adopt your products, keep hiring the great people, you know, you're, you're not going to be there. You know, it's not like Coca-Cola where you can say, okay, will people be drinking it 20 years from now? Hmm, maybe so. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that is a good business to be in. I mean, <laughs> they, uh, they deserve a high multiple uh, <laughs> compared to, to all of us here. Uh, you know, because we're in a business where uh, when you can surf, it's a beautiful thing, but you can fall off the wave very quickly.
As you might have guessed from what we just saw, there is a real battle underway between Microsoft and Sun Microsystems, between Windows NT and Java. At stake in the battle between Microsoft and Sun is the immense market for enterprise software. This is a market which has very high-level requirements for processing power and database capacity. Bill Gates has gone to great lengths to assure the enterprise computing world that Microsoft can deliver both. Uh, the biggest database server on the Internet today is one that we put up uh, to show that we could do a million times a million uh, characters of storage. In the world, uh, there are less than 20 databases of that size. In fact, we couldn't even think, where are we going to get a database of that size? And it's dramatically more than all the text on the Internet. It's dramatically more than every stock transaction that's ever taken place on every stock exchange in the history of the globe. It's actually about 20 times that much. Moving up on uh, symmetric multiprocessing to use more processors per system. Uh, we'll go from the 4, 8, or 16 you see today uh, in using uh, non-uniform memory addressing architecture, NUMA approaches go up to at least 128 processors per system. And then, of course, we'll cluster those systems together uh, which is not only a scalability technique, but a reliability technique uh, to create uh, very, very large systems uh, that are, will be able to deal with literally tens of billions of transactions. Uh, and today, there's no uh, company that needs more than about 200 million, million transactions a day. So we'll be able to be a couple of orders of magnitude ahead of, of current day requirements. The vehicle for delivering this new power is Windows NT 5.0, now renamed Windows 2000, the much-awaited upgrade to the current version of Windows NT. But it has had its problems and its bugs and its delays. If I can ship NT 5 one month sooner, you know, I'll pay an extra $100 million. I mean, that's, that's worth a lot to me. That extraordinary uh, so comment by Bill well, Gates set off a flurry of discussion about why one month of the new Windows NT was worth $100 million to Gates. The reason NT is, is such an important product for Microsoft, in my opinion, is that they really are threatened at the end client level, at the user device level, and that the world really could move away from their model. You know, this is a company that was started with the vision of a computer on every desk and in every home running Microsoft software. And they've gotten pretty close to that. But uh, if Palm Pilot is the device of the future and little portable smart cell phones are the devices of the future that will not necessarily be running Windows, you know, their future profits may come more from server products, products that are at the core of the network computing architecture as opposed to at the periphery of the computing architecture. And if that's true, then NT is the product that is their future. There is a fundamental disagreement on what the model should be for large enterprise software. The view at Sun is that proprietary platforms like Windows and immense programs like Windows NT are outdated. At the bottom, NT is just like Unix. Operating system, state-of-the-art 1985. That's when threads were first introduced, little tiny ways of doing things that you could, that were very lightweight. That's at the core of NT. It's the core of Unix now. But this is now almost the year 2000. These are operating system ideas of 25 years ago. To change the world to a world of distributed computing has it's been announced by Microsoft. The vice president of research at Microsoft, Rick Rashid, announced the death of NT. Web pages at www.research.microsoft.com. Millennium Project. We will build a world where the operating systems of today vanish where you don't think about a file name on a particular machine, that's completely antiquated and archaic. The Red Herring's Tony Perkins thinks that Bill Gates himself doesn't really believe in the future of Windows. He was still you know, presenting the Windows uh, worldview. It, it, it looked uh, basically like he was saying that you know, their five-year strategy at Microsoft continues uh, to be based on the Windows platform. Uh, frankly, I don't think he believes that. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think he's a smart uh, man who looks out into the market and realizes uh, that a 30 uh, uh, million line code piece of software uh, is not going to be able to be put into a telephone 
uh, even a downsized version of that, that these new emerging devices uh, really require a new uh, type of operating system, a new type of interface. Some analysts believe both Windows and Java will survive in a form of peaceful coexistence in the future. But for now, there is little peace between Microsoft and Sun. Uh, the pissing match between Sun and Microsoft is never ending. And they will both, uh, till the death, complain that the other's products are mediocre, inadequate, unnecessary, pick your uh, aspersive adjective. Um, however, uh, I think both companies make phenomenally good products when you get right down to it. Um, and you know they're going to be head to head for some time. Uh, Sun still currently has a much more powerful, robust uh, product for servers. And Microsoft is aiming at their business. So Sun has every incentive to insult NT to the degree that they possibly can. Sun's John Gage has his own plan for getting even with Bill Gates for all the time we spend dealing with the idiosyncrasies of Windows. It's a new whimsical website idea called Bill Bill. I th thought it would be fun to put up a web page to which you could mail the amount of time you spent this last weekend trying to make the CD-ROM connect to your Windows machine. You know, all of us lie to ourselves about how much time we spend on this. I'll just spend a few minutes. Two hours later, it still doesn't work. Well, those two hours should be mailed. The thermometer will start going up. And when the thermometer reaches a million person hours, 10 million, 100 million person hours, which I think is an estimate that's fair. If you have your machine in a year, you probably take 100 hours of your time simply to fix a file corrupted by Windows 98. Or, to rec or then you have to go to the bookstore and buy secrets of Windows and hidden secrets of Windows, an $80 book just to fix your disk drive. Or then you call Microsoft and stay waiting on the, the help call line for two hours. Put those two hours into the thermometer. So my billing bill page is a way for the world at large to say the truth. You're wasting our time. So what is the future for Microsoft and Bill Gates? Are they an unbeatable monopoly or a vulnerable old-fashioned software company? Bill Gates thinks that Microsoft has just begun to tackle the problems of making great software. Computers today, you will look back on these things as pretty bad. Uh, they don't see, they don't listen, they don't speak, they don't learn. They are cryptic. I mean, you could say everything we've done to date, uh, which you know, for a, a lot of people here is about 25 years of work, you could say it's a warm-up. Uh, it's certainly a warm-up in terms of the impact on society. Uh, it's certainly a warm-up in terms of the, the size of the business opportunity. And so it means that uh, the next 25 years should be even more fun uh, than the ones in the past. Even Gates critic John Gage thinks Microsoft is making some very good moves for the future and fixing some of the problems of the past. Microsoft today, in 1998, with wonderful programmers, some of the world's best, who have only been there a few years, when Butler Lampson from DEC, Gordon Bell from DEC, or Alvy Ray Smith, when it's Jim Kojima, when the people that are the world's best programmers, hired recently by Microsoft, arrived, they found a group of amateur programmers who had never been fixing anything, paid very little money, they essentially gave a failing grade to all the people at Microsoft in the software divisions. There is some concern that Microsoft, with its very wealthy stock optioned employees, could be getting a little fat and lazy, and that some of its better programmers might just want to call it quits. But Gates says he isn't concerned. I knew that a lot of people would retire uh, when they got very wealthy. I'm actually surprised more haven't uh, retired. And from time to time, there's a there comes a person where we have to say, hey, you should retire. Uh, you know, excellence is what it's all about. It's not some game of, of uh, you know, let's, let's have the same old club meeting we had 10 years ago. But people have wanted to work and they've risen to the challenge uh, uh, better uh, than I would have expected. And that's, you know, just the run of luck we've had and uh, it, it makes it a lot of fun. In fact, Gates says, the financial success of Microsoft's employees means fun has to be one of the key motivators for the people who work there. They come to work every day because they like their job. 
And it's fun to think that's the threshold test a company has to meet. It's not, ha ha, they'll be in here today. They need the paycheck, ha 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 ha. I mean, is that really how the rest of business works? Well, we don't have that advantage. If so, uh, you know, our, our people are, are there because uh, it's very exciting. Uh, the frontiers are still out there in front of us. Perhaps what should bother Bill Gates is a growing animosity toward him and Microsoft, an attitude that was prevalent at a recent panel discussion led by Fortune magazine's David Kirkpatrick. I was really struck at the Microsoft panel yesterday at the animosity toward Microsoft among the attendees at this conference. It was really surprising to me that really in a room with 75 or 90 people, most of them software and hardware industry executives, primarily software, um, the only two people in the room that were consistently defending Microsoft were myself and Tony Perkins, the publisher of The Red Herring, another journalist. Um, and that virtually every industry player in the room was really cheering on the Justice Department and, and, and somehow thought that there's something wrong just that Microsoft has the dominance that it has. And, and almost impl implicitly believing that it's illegal for them to be as big as they are. Tony Perkins may be David Kirkpatrick's ally in articulating the value of Microsoft to the computer industry, but even Perkins says the decade of Microsoft dominance may be ending. In this era where we see an explosion uh, in new computer devices and platforms, uh, none of which I think will be dominated, none of the new categories will be dominated by Microsoft. A, a great example of that is the new uh, Palm Pilot. Very, very fashionable product uh, amongst professionals. Uh, and it's very interesting because it is neither a Microsoft nor an Intel uh, uh, technology-based product. So what does that mean? I think what, what it, it's probably more uh, significant uh, psychologically than it is even commercially because what's happening is that you're, you're, uh, the world is, is uh, or 3Com who produces the Palm Pilot is creating millions of users uh, for the Palm Pilot who are now saying, hey, I, it's possible for me to operate a non-Wintel based computer device. John Gage thinks the millennium clock is ticking on Gates and that the next few years are critical to his future. If he has five years of continuing with his giant tanker in the same direction with market dominance. Five years. So by the year 2003, is there a Microsoft that looks anything like the Microsoft today? I predict that he will break off applications groups. He will begin to focus on the very low-end devices, but it means he has to abandon all Windows, all NT, all of that, and do something new, and they're working on that at Microsoft, believe me now, right now. Well, we've looked at the complex world of Microsoft and the challenges Bill Gates faces in the next decade, but will Bill Gates be there to tackle those challenges? What does he see in his future? An even bigger Microsoft? More money? At any point in Microsoft's history, I saw a path that if things went well and we did a great job, to double the size of the company. And if anybody had said to me, but can you make the company four times the size, I would say, no, I don't think so. Uh, when we were 100 million, I would have said, I don't think we can get to 400 million. Or 400 million, I don't think we can get to 1.6 billion. And, you know, the higher you get, the further down there is to fall. Uh, pretty far at this point. Uh, and, and I have to say, I feel exactly the same way I've always felt. Uh, if things went extremely well, uh, I can see how we'd get to double the size we are today. But I, I, I don't see any way, uh, from where I'm sitting right now, since I'd actually have to do it, uh, to get to four times our current size. And that doesn't bother me at all. I mean, you know, you know making a few billion here, a few billion there, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alex View says we are seeing a new Bill Gates, a calmer, more mature Gates. Gates has reached a point of his life where success is not anymore an issue, where recognition is not a m anymore a theme because he's as popular as a president uh, of a big nation, even as popular today around the world, and as respected as the president of the United States. The, 
economic power of his firm and the economic power of, uh, uh, of his personality, because he owns so much of Microsoft, supersedes everything else. And because of that, Gates has reached a point, the shores of calm and, f and serenity. It is very interesting to see him now relaxed because he knows that Bill Gates has eventually matured. But John Gage doesn't quite agree. He says Gates still acts occasionally like an adolescent. And it is that part of Gates' personality that drove Sun to sue Microsoft over their use of Java. So how do you change the behavior of a spoiled child? You either spank the child or you give the child candy. Well, so which direction were we going to take with Microsoft? We try both all the time. That's why we seem to be so strange in our dealing with Microsoft. Scott McNeely will attack Microsoft because that's the only way, it seems, to get their attention. And then with engineering, we work very closely with Microsoft, they have wonderful engineers, to work together to improve the technical capability of these systems. So we said, look, you, this time, we're going to spank you. But even John Gage agrees that we are seeing a more mature and statesmanlike Bill Gates, and this new Bill Gates seems to be going back to his roots, his love for software. I'm a specialist, and you know, software is what I love, and so my life's work is, is at Microsoft building great software. Uh, there is a question of when I should turn over the particular job title that I have today, uh, CEO, to someone else. I can't imagine somebody who's 60 years old running Microsoft. Uh, it, I think it's, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be done. Uh, I can imagine a 60-year-old sitting around, helping out, you know, maybe going back and writing a little code, being a nice guy. Uh, uh, and you know, I'm looking forward to it. Gates is, has been, and always will be a fierce competitor in life as well as in business. Perhaps a final insight into the mind of this man who rules the software world can be gleaned from this anecdote as relayed by David Kirkpatrick. Somebody here told me the story that they had once played ping pong with Bill Gates at his house and beat Bill two games in a row. And it was a party, a lot of his friends were there, and he came up afterwards to this guy with other people with an earshot and said, you humiliated me in front of my friends. And this guy's response was, well, <laughs> Get better, <laughs> you know. But the fact is, this is a guy that can't stand to lose at anything he does. Bill Gates is a complex man, a man with great power and a man with great responsibilities. He has certainly left his mark on the world. It remains to be seen whether it is a passing mark or a failing one. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Computer Chronicles. Hope we'll see you here again next time. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by BigStar.com with thousands of videos and DVDs for the whole family. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. Next week on the Computer Chronicles, the best of Comdex. You'll see the new WebPad, a wireless appliance for surfing the web. Forget learning a foreign language. This new software can speak for you. This is the C-Pen. It'll take notes for you and dump them into your PC. And consumer convergence has arrived with Avid Cinema for Windows. Coming up next week on the Computer Chronicles.